Hello, hello, hello. A very warm welcome to all our friends, viewers, stakeholders, fans of Africa Rise with Susan West on this beautiful Sunday here in London. And of course, around the world, I do hope that your day began very well and is rounding up very smoothly. And unfortunately, our guest for today on Africa Rise with Susan West is joining us from the Republic, um, the, D the, the DRC, from Congo. And um, we've been having technical issues getting him on. He has tried to come on for about an hour. We have battled it and we finally decided to reschedule um, the topic or the, the broadcast with him today. So I do apologize, but it is not in our character not to come on, at least to talk to you for a few minutes and explain to you why we're not going to have the conversation as slated or as advertised. So as you join today's broadcast, please um, like, follow, and share our, our broadcast. If you're watching from YouTube and you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. And one more thing, Facebook is now taking away the watch party facility, which means that everyone who doesn't like and follow us on Facebook um, or subscribe to our YouTube channel might not be able to see our broadcast after the 7th of April because Facebook will not allow for people to um share or create what create uh, sorry create watch parties and so you know what i know you guys have had a fantastic day if you want to just call in and just chat with me a little bit that will be fun koti ekapong sony iamba thank you hello she says koti i've missed you um a few episodes you haven't turned in and um, if you want to call in and just chat about how your day's been going that's fine but what we're going to what we intend to do today is to re rebroadcast uh, one of our very first episodes in the year uh, 2021, which was very, very informative. And I, I know that not many... I am so sorry. Um, we just had some some something just went wrong. We couldn't. We don't know what happened. But um, well, welcome back. Welcome back. Sorry about that. These things do happen. Technical issues, unintentional. Like I was saying. Koti, thanks for staying. <laughs> if you want to call in and just have a chat about how your day has been going, that's absolutely fine. Otherwise, we intend to rebroadcast one of our finest interviews we've had on Africa. A very warm welcome. Hello, hello, hello. A very warm And so um, please take away from it whatever you can. Um, it is the interview we had with Dr. Akanimo Odon. I will be replaying that interview. He 
has gone out of his way to make sure that we have everything we need, you know, to begin the new year on Africa Rise. So, um, oh, environment. Uh, right. Happy New Year to you happy and all of your viewers as well. Fantastic. Right, right, right. So, without taking too much of your time, just go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself. So, my name is Akan, Dr. Akan Morgan, and I, I am the Africa Strategy Advisor for Lancaster University in the UK. But I'm also the Chief Executive of uh, a small consulting company in the UK called Envirofly Consulting. And mm -hmm. what we do, we, we help develop uh, international partnerships between UK and African organizations. My network and coverage covers over 30 African countries, so I'm always on the road. Um, though I haven't been on the road for a long time now because of the COVID lockdown. It's mm. about, within that, I, 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 I'm very interested in capacity building. I'm very interested in knowledge transfer. I'm interested in the navigation of the gaps between academia, industry, and government, which I'm, 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 I'm going to speak to, um, speak, uh, maybe speak to at some point in, in, in the in mm. day. So that's a little about me. I'm, I'm passionate about Africa. I, li I live in England. I'm Nigerian. Um, I'm married with two kids. And uh, yeah, that's happening. That's me. Thank you. Thank you. And so quickly, I know that you do a lot of work on the African continent in career development for young people. So do you want to tell us a little bit about that? So um, like I told you, I travel an awful lot. I remember, for example, last year, between January and February, just before we got into lockdown in March, I think I did about seven countries. And in my job as I travel, I meet different uh, individuals, I meet different organizations, institutions, I meet like a vice chancellors, directors, I meet students. And originally my, my job was focused around uh, navigating with institutions, mostly universities in different African countries. But ultimately, mm -hmm. as I progressed in what I do, I discovered the interaction with, with students and ultimately got, getting exposed to the issues and problems and challenges that students actually do face. Mm. And because of that, I, I develop an interest in understanding what is it about them. And in the UK, for example, for over 10 years, I co-founded an NGO called Exxon Foundation. And for 10 years, we organized one of the largest international conferences of Nigerian students in the UK, which mm. now knows dive into a conference of African students called TISCA. That was the International Conference of Nigerian Students Icon. And over a 10 year per period, I engage a lot more with students, understanding what is that conversion, that gap between being a student, moving to be becoming a graduate, becoming a professional. It's like, it's like mm. a three, three level step move. And so I got fascinated with that. And so when I travel and I meet organizations, I, I, I meet students, I interview students. And before you know it, I develop a passion for career. And ultimately, and I, I see myself as an example because my career was a bit scattered, to be honest. I mean, I studied zoology as my, my, from, my, from, my, from my first degree, and I went on to do a master's in environmental rehabilitation. Then I moved on to do a PhD in environmental management at Lancaster University. Right. So if you ask me right now, I mean, I try, but basically most of what I do is got no, no, no strong relationship or link where I studied. And, 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 I'm, and I'm lucky. There are many students who don't, that don't have that connection between what they study in university and how they graduate into professional work. And I can give you many examples. And so that's actually how I developed this, this uh, passion for careers. Because for me, Africa as a continent, its success, its progress, its, its sustenance and sustainability is dependent on the African youth. And if the African youth are still disenfranchised and, and confused, then we have a fundamental problem. So as much as possible, if I can do a little thing, uh, maybe some, some little effort, some, some some interesting initiatives or some schemes, and I'm able to mitigate those dimensions, I'm a very happy man. That, that, that's how I'm right. going Yeah. Right. So this thing of studying something else in the university and coming out into the real world and doing yeah. something totally different from what you studied is, is not a uniquely African thing. It's not at all. Absolutely not. I mean, if, if you ask the, the average person, or even in the UK, and, 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 and I also realize that most folks who come, especially from African countries, who come study in the UK for a master's degree program, um, if you ask most of them, uh, I think what, what normally happens is when they finish their degrees or their master's degree program, whatever the case is, um, there's no like in clear plan of what they want to go and do when they return back home. But, but I think there's even a, a, a bigger issue. A bigger issue is the fact that 
a UK university might be great and fantastic in terms of advising UK students on how to arrange their careers, do a beautiful CV and get jobs in the UK. But what experience does a UK advice or career officer have in advising the Nigerian how to get a job back home in Nigeria? Most of them have no clue, or a Kenyan or a Zambian. It's very yeah. difficult. And so you find students paying lots of money for tuition fees and coming to study in the UK, I mean, added with the maintenance fees and all the travel fees and all the visa fees, and it's crazy. And at, at the end of the master, you suddenly go, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? I don't want to go back home. I don't have a job. To stay in the UK, if, if visa rules permit you, then you are okay. So mm. most of your students get into this kind of, um, almost like a, like a limbo. I mm. so much money. So part of my vision, really, part of my, part of my passion is to help those students navigate those, 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 those spaces. Because you can't spend so much money and yet you finish the university with an incredible, incredible degree from a tough university and you are still confused. There is a reason you are confused. And I think mm. that is you will remain in limbo. So I guess for me, it's not actually an African thing. It even happens in the UK. I mean, mm. as, if you ask many SME owners, I mean, a really simple way to know this is, ask many SME owners, and I've done this several for the last five years, and you ask them, so how many of you SME owners um, maybe set up uh, your SME based on what you studied? Mm. Guess what? My, my research shows less than 10% of them set up their SMEs based on what they studied. And if you mm. ask, you now say, well, how many of you set up a, 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 an SME based on a passion or an interest you have, or you saw a market need or a demand or, in, or a gap? Mm. And all of a sudden, th 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 that, that number rises to over 60, 70% in some cases. And so what's the connection between what you studied and what you are doing now? And in, right. some, cases, in some cases, it's not even a function of what you studied. It's your, your capacity to understand how to translate what you've studied into a career prospect. Right. What is zoology, Susan? I'm yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> when in Niger sorry, sorry, just on a lighter note. When in Nigeria studies zoology, I'm wondering, what were you thinking? <laughs> what were you thinking? If you met in Nigeria, who wakes up in the morning and feels a jam form, like, you know, jam is a joint admission matriculation board, which is the official... Uh, examination requirements or, or if like criteria to get into Nigerian yeah. university. If you meet a Nigerian who, when they are filling their jam form, write zoology, go and find the person. There's something wrong with them upstairs. It is, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is every chance that the person is confused. The people who study zoology are people like us who couldn't study medicine because our jam score wasn't very high. You know, I remember I took uh, my jam score and to get into medicine, you have to score 250 or two and above. My, right. first, my first jam, I had 204. So I told myself, it's okay, uh, they will give me zoology. In, in, in Nigeria, in some cases, they call it those uh, epilepsy courses because it's nobody wants to go to. Don't touch. And you are putting one corner of university. That is the perception. The mm. point, I, I remember taking jam again, and this time I had 205. So it was just one point better than the last jam I had. And, but the point is, throughout our studying zoology, studying animals and fishes, how fishes breathe. What is my business with how fishes breathe? I mean, I'm, I'm not saying it's, it's a bad thing, but what, <laughs> what, 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 what would I use that knowledge to do when I graduate? Or how lions roar? Or the heart dimension of, a, of, of, of an earthworm? My mm. goodness, are you kidding me? So, but my point is, if there was nobody to tell me systematically the specific courses or the modules or the mm -hmm. key, or, or if like that I can, I can use or tap into within mm. zoology and the link to career prospects mm. so that it's easier. Mm. So I finished my first degree or rather my first day in, 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 in zoology, second year in zoology, and I kept thinking to myself, but how many zoos are there in Nigeria? I mean, you, you and I know there are probably only one or two zoos and to right. find a reasonable animal in the zoo, it, it's a problem. So I kept telling myself, I better be the best in my class if I want to get a job in that zoo. That is how myopic I am. And but mm. the point is, I even think I'm even a bit exposed. There are many students who have no clue what they will do with their course. Just go to class, take theoretical things, pass examinations, and when you mm. finish, do for something. To, to, to show you how things differ, I finished mm. zoology. My first job 
was working in a bank. Can, can you imagine? What is the commission? Except there was a small zoo behind the bank or they were keeping animals. I have, I have no idea what the connection is. See, but the point is, I didn't realize that some specific skills that was being developed or inculcated in me as I was mm -hmm. doing theology were fundamental even to working in the bank. This right. piece of analytical skills, simple, simple things uh, so, uh, 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 around team building. My goodness, I was the president of the zoology department of uh, 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 that, that is, that is, um, the zoology student union. I picked right. up incredible leadership skills. I didn't even know it was transferable. In my mm. mind, I was to finish university and go and look for one zoo to work somewhere. Mm. It was my second year of zoology that I had a game changer. And this is important for career progression for students. Mm. I used to be a professor. I'm sorry I'm taking your time, uh, Susan. But this it's is all right. Go ahead. Go ahead. I met, I met a professor. It's uh, Professor Lawrence Zemoya. He's currently the vice chancellor of um, Ibnedio University, one of the, which is the first premier private university in Nigeria. Yeah. And he used to be a flashy prop that he, he had all the nice nice cars. And I was wondering, ah, this, you know, when other professors were managing their small beetles, this prof would come mm -hmm. to class or come to departments with beautiful cars. I said, wondering, ah, what is this prof? Where, where does he work? He's a lecturer in the same zoology. Mm -hmm. So how to get his attention? And I tell people, how do you get a professor's attention? Mm -hmm. This is a simple explanation. Be the best in his course. Oh, I be the worst. I blasted the guy's course. <laughs> <laughs> there, are no, there are no born now. He took note of me. And so we right. became friends. So I said, asking prof, aren't you a lecturer in zoology? I mean, how come you are like in a nice flashy car looking good? What, what work do you do? Then he tells mm. me, oh, you know, that I'm actually a consultant to Shell, to Chevron and Mobile. These are all big oil wow. companies. I'm thinking, mm. what is the connection between you being a lecturer of zoology and working in oil companies? Then he tells me, no, oh, no, no, no. He handles the environmental impact assessment. So he mm. studies the impact of oil spills on soil organisms, on fishes, mm. and oil biota. I'm like, really? Can mm. you believe it was the first time I heard of the term environmental management? Can you believe that? Right. So I told myself, I said, listen, friend, I'm going to be the best in my zoology course. As I was finishing zoology, that's the reason why my master's degree was in environmental rehabilitation. And right. my PhD was in environmental management. It mm. exposed me to the fundamentals of environmental sustainability. But that is because I had some guidance. Mm. Absolutely. You had guidance. One of the things I've come to know, I, 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 um, I, have, I have a teenage son who goes to school here. Okay. And I know that from year seven to year eight to year nine, they are already, um, the, the school environment allows them to begin to think. They begin to get the support depending on their strength areas. They are somehow guided and directed towards the areas that they, you know, they, they're strong in. And yeah. I just, I said to my son, when I was writing my JS3 exam, to go to SS1. There was no one to tell me, you don't have any business going into a biology, chemistry, and phys physics wow. class. Yeah. Because this is this is what you're good at. You're good in the arts, you're, do, you're good at this, you're talented in this. If there were people, instead of just leaving it to the, the children to just choose if they want to go in, because some of us ended up going there because we had friends there or because it was something that was, you know, um, 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 What's the word now? You know, yeah. something that. Um, <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry, I'm digressing. Welcome, Benson Rotendo Martin Yarari, <laughs> our, our brother from Zimbabwe. And uh, Zero Babel, welcome, Agbo Nene, welcome, Dodi William West, welcome. Some of the names I've scrolled up. I'm going to I'm going to acknowledge all of you, you know. So you see, the thing is. The kind of education that we end up, I'm not sure about the other parts of Africa, you will be in better position to, to say, to know that. But yeah. in Nigeria, it's a situation where they just abandon the children 
to just you just decide what you want to do as you go as you as you move on you know there is no mentorship there is no guidance you know to say these are the strong areas we have noticed that you're you're very good at why don't you look at it because i remember when my son was coming to say he wanted to do stuff and he wanted to take certain course and he was told why don't you you know no one is forcing you it's just a suggestion because they seen how where your um your strong um where your strength is so i'll quickly go ahead if you want to respond to that fine but i'll quickly ask them um, um this question with the um rapid um growth of um uh, the population the african uh, youth population you know um of course we the undp have estimated that by 2050 they they it will be it, um it, it, um 830 million you yeah. know so um with a with a with a with a, with a, a population that is fast out you know uh, growing the rest of the world what's I, i'm i'm wondering um what would be what does this mean what does this mean for the for the unemployment um, in africa uh, generally so so it's a very good question you raise i think it comes back to the same point and just to go back to what you said the, the yeah. issue across africa i've traveled across africa enough to know and it's funny but see but the point is when i meet nigerians and they complain i actually laugh because nigeria i mean to nigeria it's not like saying to Nigerians who are complaining, I can assure you that Nigeria is a lot better than many other African countries, and that's a fact. It's true. Mm -hmm. And so, but the point is, the issues remain. And you're talking about this explosion of youth, youth explosion in Africa, and estimated to hit the 840 million by 2050. And mm. the point is, this is going to impact on employment. And, and and the reason is because as long as Africans are graduating from university and they're thinking continuously about setting or working for somebody, so the employment leverage. So, but the point is, if there's no creation of jobs, then where would you work? Mm. So in my book, the way I've, I've targeted it, I've called it the three E's, and it's fundamental. What are the three E's or the, the, the three, three career E routes? The first one is employment. So, I mean, you finish university, you work for somebody, yeah? That's E. Second employment, second E, it's a uh, it's enterprise or entrepreneurship. So you finish university and set up your own business, okay? Mm. So something and you employ others. Mm. E is education. So you finish your first degree and you like it so much book like me, then you go and do the masters. You finish mm. the master's, you like enough book, you do a PhD. Mm. So what the except Africans and Nigerians and Ghanaians and Kenyans understand that while they're in university it's fundamental for them to appreciate this three e dimension even before they graduate that mm -hmm. then it reduces their chances of unemployment what do i mean mm -hmm. so normally, when someone graduates you, what, what normally happens is you find a student who is looking for a job so you put, put up a nice cv so he finishes university and applies for a job and then after six months he doesn't have any job then the bills are piling up he's sharing the same pot with his mom and the mom is looking at him with the corner of her eye, say, is it not time for you to be feeding the family? What are you still doing in my house? And mm. before you know, there is so much pressure. And then for the first time, they are considering the second E, which is enterprise, mm. entrepreneurship. Right. But because there's, there's under so much pressure, whatever they see, they do, there's not enough planning. Are you following me? Mm. In some cases, some people would finish, as they are finishing university, it's already clear in their mind that they they want to uh, open their own company, okay? And then mm -hmm. they the set up their company, and after one year, they lose a big contract. Everything comes crashing down. Mm -hmm. So for the first time they're considering, now I need to get a job. That's the, considering the second E employment. Right. Now, my, my issue is this. Imagine if every student were prepared while they were in university. I mean, three years, four years, five years in some courses, it's a long time. Mm. It, while you are doing all of that, you're preparing for the three E routes. So that if you finish university, look at me. It's a long time I've worked for somebody over 10 years. Mm. But guess what? If you if you want to give me a job now, if God forbid all my companies fail, I've mm. got a CV ready to apply for work. I'm I'm not a novice, even though right. I'm in internship. Are you following me? Mm -hmm. More specifically, what education pathways, what new programs, what new courses to do next? And so right. don't 
you have to wait until you finish university and then you are being thrown in the mix and in the midst of the chaos and trouble is when you mm. now make the biggest career mistakes. And mm. that's and to be honest, if you want to know, the government is supposed to provide the enabling environment that people say for employment mm. growth, which is the reason why one of the key economic indices in national economies is em- unemployment levels. What is mm. the unemployment levels? But the point is this. How many times or how long, Susan, have we been depending on Nigerian government, on Ghanaian government, on Kenyan government, on Zimbabwean government to give us employment? Mm. If you give us employment, won't the average individual grab their own career bulls by the horn and find your own way? That's my premise. Because depending on government, doesn't the, the seem to be working. And hopefully at some point in the future, when they get their, their acts together, they can help things and make things better. But for mm-hmm. now, the question is, what can you, the individual, do? The question is, what can you do? Absolutely. What is that? that you're you're gifted with what is that that is your strength what is that that is your interest or something you're passionate about so that brings me to asking you do uh, consultancy work here in the uk and all over the continent of africa what would you say is a difference you know with the um, um as far as career development goes in, with the universities or the schooling system so i think what i say a few differences that, that kind of actually has impacted what I now do professionally. So because of my exposure and experience working in international education in the UK, and mm. I currently advise many UK universities, mm. if I can see those gaps, it's easy for me to translate those learnings and knowledge, knowledge bases to mm. impacting education in Africa. So for example, there is a massive gap between, in Africa, there's a massive gap between academia, industry, and government, a huge gap. Mm. Um, and so the government would say, well, we have power, so come to us. Then academia, universities would say, well, we have knowledge, so you come to us. Mm. And then the industry and companies would say, we have money, come to us. And as long as nobody goes to the other, nothing happens. But right. there's a gap between universities and industry. Mm. I actually call it the high gate agenda. <laughs> I surprise you, but it's true. Have you noticed that each time you go to a Nigerian university or an African university, mm. and I saw a case happen where it became clear to me that it's actually a big deal. Mm. So I was uh, I was being driven from Lagos to Ibadan for, for, for the Nigerians listening to me. It's, it's about a hundred kilometers drive, and as I was driving, I think I counted over fifteen or more new universities. That is because there is so much demand for higher education, but there, there mm. are not enough universities to meet the demand. Are you following me? Mm. But how did I know that these were universities? In two simple ways. First and foremost, they had very interesting exotic names. Okay, mm-hmm. uh, something uh, uh, Jeruba Bell Exotic University Limited. You know what I mean? Exotic name. Yeah. Jeruba Bell. <laughs> but secondly, it was the High Gate, huge monster gate. So. I started doing an experiment, I started understanding, I started, I started studying different universities in Kenya, mm. in Zambia, in, in, in Uganda, and they all had something in common. They had this huge, mighty gate, endless. I remember uh, a friend of mine told me that there was a case where a Kenyan university mm. broke down a functioning high gate, I mean, I mean the entrance gate, mm. just to build an even higher one. <laughs> It is called higher learning. <laughs> <laughs> I wish it was higher learning. So it's almost as if universities go out of their way to exclude themselves from industry that mm. they prepare students for. They, 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 they have massive walls, huge gates. Don't talk to us. We are professor. We are the right. boss. But they are broke. No money in the pocket. <laughs> what, right. is the, what is the point? So. In the UK, for example, there is an intentional approach. It's a, it's a conscious strategy to block the gap between university and industry. Mm. A series of models and strategies. So, for example, you go to university, you almost cannot tell the difference between the university and the town. Are you following yes. me? Yes, absolutely. Of, they're all integrated. Yes. You go to all the universities in the UK, and you discover that 
within the universities, for example, Lancaster does this very, very well. It's called yes. co-location. What is co-location? Because the universities believe that if you integrate universities and industry so mm. well together, it has an impact on the students. And so in co-location, the idea is, so for example, the Department of Environment in Lancaster mm. University. What if I told you that the Department of Environment at Lancaster University has over 23 environmental companies, SME, mm. resident in the department? Because the belief is there is no way uh, a CEO of a company and a professor would enter the same lift every day. That at some point, they won't turn to each other and ask, but what do you even do? And so you are bridging those gaps. And so how do you increase those leverages to help make it easy for universities to interact a lot better with these companies? And for me, that absolutely, I think for me, so the ultimate, um, it's like differentiating factor between when I work with universities in the UK and when I work with universities in Africa, is that gap because it has a huge impact on the students. Does that make sense? Is that gap between universities and industry? Right. Um, this is so interesting. I'm going to take quick reads of some of the comments that have come in. Yes, um, I need to, I can't see some of them. Um, just give me a moment. That's all right. right. I'm going to quickly read. Rotendo Benson Martin Yarari says, you are right, my brother. The education, government, and business symbiosis is known as the triple helix as well. It's that collaboration that the West used to develop, and we need that convergence in Africa. And um, um, Longwe Kangwa says, academias have knowledge, governments have power, industry have money, NGO, NGO have rights, everyone in their bubble. <laughs> if everyone is in their bubble, is it a good thing or a bad thing now? Dangerous thing, terrible. Absolutely. <laughs> and um, of course, um, Nathaniel Okoko says, greetings to Mr. Akanimo and Susan West. Greetings, Rahina, ben, welcome. I see you. And right. So I'm going to continue taking more comments as we go on. But quickly, I'm going to go on to talking about your book which I have here. I've got a signed copy here, The Graduate Code. <laughs> the Graduate you. Code. Such a, such a fantastic book. I started reading it and I wanted, I said to my son, he's 15, I said, you must read this book. I was not as fortunate as you are to get opportunities like this. In, I remember one of the comments is in every professional, there is a student and there yeah. is, in every student, there is a professional, something like that. Why yeah. did you decide to write this book? So, um, so, so that phrase is in every professional, there is a student wanting to learn. Right. And in every student, there is a professional there waiting to earn. Waiting and, to earn. That's correct. And, and, and until you are able to connect both worlds, the mm. world student and the professional, then you're in a problem. Mm. See, see, the issue is this. Many students don't realize, this is very important, that they've got two status. It's because, because it's a very simple trick, but it's a powerful, powerful revelation. Once you understand this, things are different. When you understand that as a student, follow me, that you are a student, that's your first status. Your second status is you are a potential professional. Potential professional. PP. You are <laughs> in both status. You are a yeah. student. Except you are like some students who want to remain in the university forever, not live there. You finish, you will die there as a student. Well, <laughs> if you are that kind of student, you shouldn't be on this call. Please, could you leave? <laughs> but if, if you are a student and you're looking forward to working or setting up your own company or graduate, mm -hmm. then that means even at this moment you are a potential professional right the students who make it the fact who make mm. it as a professional is students who can operate in both status while they are in one location as a absolutely student, 
and as a potential professional. Because when you mm. understand, when you're leaving your house, going to class in the morning, and your psyche and your mindset understand that you are a professional in the making, it mm. things you do. It does. So I tell you a story. So I remember I, I it was in Nigeria. I was addressing a, a room of about two hundred students, so over two hundred students. And this, mm. this, this, these are final year students, by the way. So I remember asking a, 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 a series of questions, and I asked, and I said, um, so how many of you final year students have loved the course you are doing? Mm. And only five hands went up. Susan, there, there's there's trouble. For only five final year students. Who were just about to leave university love the course they were doing. That itself is first trouble. So I now said, okay, wait. Okay, second question. So how many of you, even though you don't love your course, mm. have an idea, a sense of what you might want to do when you graduate? Mm. The hands were ridiculous. Right. So, and I asked the final question. So how many of you have an idea of what you might want to do? Even though you don't love your course, mm. and five hands went up. For me, that is almost like a that is a, that is a, that is chaos about to happen, and you wonder why Africa is confused with so mm. much unemployment. When people graduating even have no clarity or no idea of what they want to do afterwards, after, after school, university. So I remember I told myself, so friend, I can you have to read this book because students cannot be this confused. Even if the book is to give a sense of direction, no matter how small, people mm. need to have some sense of clarity of what they would want to do after they've spent four years, five years undertaking a course. That's mm. why I wrote Absolutely. You know, when you mentioned about um, a lot of the students, final year students especially, not even sure of what they were going to do or if they love the course, I will tell yeah. you, I was one of the people, when I, when I first um try to gain admission into university i came from a polytechnic studying mass communication and then wanting to study something in line with that and they would not give me what i wanted to study i kept i refused going to the university three 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 years in a row because i was thinking that if i was stubborn enough and kept asking for a particular course then yeah. i would finally get it but guess what? I didn't have it. I, I, I was never given that. I was brought in to study sociology, which is something they just put up. They just they didn't even ask me if I was interested. They just gave it to me. And so, of course, I took it. But in the process of, of, of you know, um, studying, I began to, you know, gain passion for for because I realized that it was a waste of time if I did not begin to love the course I was I was I was in university for. But of course, I always knew, <laughs> I always knew that it was going to be helping me gain some transferable skills, even yeah. as I studied sociology for what eventually I wanted to do, which is be, remain in media, be on television, do journalism, whatever it was that I wanted to do, aside from the other things that I do, the other many things that I do. <laughs> so what would you describe as your, what would you define as your international African professional? Or who would you describe? It's a really good question. And um, so maybe I'll put it this way. So before COVID, so before COVID, yeah, if you ask the average person, um, how many countries did you go to? This is very important as well. How many countries have you been? So maybe they haven't been to many, many questions, many countries physically. So uh, Nigeria, maybe Ghana, that's it. But if you ask many people now, how many countries have you virtually been to over the COVID period? The numbers will go out of the roof. Susan, do you know in my house in Lancaster, I've been in 25 countries virtually without leaving my house. Okay? So, now, but the, but the point is this. COVID, now this is important. COVID as a problem made us begin to trans navigate in the virtual space mm. okay so the so the issue is this is it that covid brought the assets and resources and equipment and materials you needed to trans navigate virtually no internet was there before covid so mm. you trans navigate virtually if you wanted to 
Right. But you never considered it important to do that. Mm. So the world is globally connected and no, nothing has shown us as much as COVID has. Mm. You are a Kenyan living in Kenya. What do you know about Tanzania? It's only next door. It's literally an hour and a half flight. What do you know about Tanzania? Do you know that there is somebody looking for your skill set and capacity next door in Tanzania? But as mm. long as in your mind you've created a bubble for yourself and you're a Kenyan professional, you mm. will only be exposed to Kenyan opportunities. Do you know that some, some eight years ago, eight, nine years ago, my LinkedIn nomenclature, my title on LinkedIn was mm. Nigeria. But I realized that for over six months, Susan, all the links, all the contacts, all the requests I was getting had to do with Nigeria. Right. So one day I woke up in the morning and I said, well, wait a minute. Huh? What will it take to, to call myself African expert? So at the, <laughs> at the time, it's true, it's a simple question. At the time, yes. I knew something about the Ghana, I knew something about maybe Kenya. So I changed my nomenclature to African expert. Hmm. In a space of one or two weeks, I was getting bombarded by requests and opportunities from other African countries hmm. just by a change of name. Everybody listening to me, try a small experiment. It's very simple. Ask yourself, which of these two would you like to be called? Hmm. A. a I am a Nigerian professional. I just I, and I'm interested in overseas or international work. Or B, I am an international professional. I just happen to be living in Nigeria. Absolutely. If I'm right, <laughs> if if your if your 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 audience or your your your, your listeners are listening to me, could they respond A or B in the chat section of WhatsApp or or, or Facebook? So we can see what people are saying. People should respond. What would you prefer to be called? Mm. I am a Kenyan professional and I'm interested in international work. Or I am an international professional who just happens to be living in Kenya. In Kenya. Which would you prefer? See, see, when you restrict, and it begins with the mind, when you restrict mm. your space, you restrict your mind, it affects your placing, your placement. Yes. You your space to restrict your place. And so the, 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 the international African professional is yeah. the professional that understands that your skills, your capacity, your competence, your expertise mm. is not only relevant in your geographical space. There is a potential for its relevant and application in other spaces. Mm. And so because you are aware, it drives your action. So, for example, if I told you one of my New Year's resolution for 2021 it might surprise you, but guess what it is? I told you, and this year, part of what I want to do is to increase my network in Egypt and Morocco. Right. That is because I am well known. I've got incredible network across different African countries. Mm. So. This year, I'm con and, and, and friends, it has to be a conscious thing to be international. That mm. means I not only just wake up in the morning, I'm conscious with which friends I accept. You know, many people wake up in the morning and they just see Facebook, the uh, uh, friendship, accept, welcome, accept, uh, mm. criminal, accept, yes. favorite, you know, accept. <laughs> you see, so that is the, the dimension of an African international professional, somebody not, not restricted by geographical space, by boundary mm -hmm. or your location. You are able to interject. You are able to interact. You are able mm -hmm. to navigate minor right. spaces to be relevant in a global space. That's, that's what it means. Wow. Wow. I'm going to take quick reads again. Yes, there please. is Nelly Longwe Kangwa who says, amazing book. I've read it 10 times, back to back. The Graduate Code is my main. Oh, wow. This person has read your book 10 times, <laughs> 10 times. And um, um, 
Laurel Zero, okay, Zero Babel. I'll just go with Zero Babel. Doctor Odon, 100% fat. I remember my friend far back years studied engineering at Unilag, but ended working at Unilag as a radio presenter. I studied business administration, but here I am working as a presenter. Though my dream course, oh, it jumped up. It's where, where is where are all this? Though my dream course is mass communication. I was yeah. so desperate to get admission. So I just rushed the opportunity I saw at Yabatek in Lagos, Nigeria. As uh, Susan, great job. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. You necessarily don't have to be hard on yourself if you're studying, if you're working on something else it's totally different from what you've studied, as long as it's something you enjoy and you're passionate about. Absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> and and so in this in this um COVID-19 um new era of COVID, you know, what ways would you say a, a, a professional should develop their careers? for sustainable success? So, I mean, there are a range of things, to be honest. I mean, I think it's, um, maybe I'll just give some very high level points and how you, some strat strategies for developing your career. So first and foremost, think about yourself as any career, the, the sustenance, this is very important, the sustenance or the sustainability or longevity of any career is based on your capacity to provide a solution to a problem. Mm. The, reason why, the reason why Susan at Africa Rise is because there is a problem of the lack of incredible information about mm. Africa's growth and development. And so Absolutely. the reason why you own this show is because you are providing a solution to a problem. Mm. 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 Coca-Cola as a company, okay? What problem? There is no company, no individual, no organization, no institution you can think about. By design, by default, they are designed to provide a solution to a problem or else it's a waste of time. Mm. Coca-Cola as a company provides a, a solution to the problem of thirst. In some cases, to the problem of the lack of sugar. But, mm -hmm. but the problem is some people don't like too much sugar. So what did Coke do? Coke designed diet Coke that mm. reduces the sugar. It's still mm. providing a solution to a problem. Mm. As time progressed, the company Coca-Cola realized some people don't like sugar at all. What did they do? They designed diet Coke Zero. This mm. one is Coke, tastes like Coke, is sweet me for body like Coke, is cold. <laughs> But it has no sugar at all. They are still providing a solution to a problem. Mm. And it's so bad that some people love, they love strawberry. So they say, okay, that's good. So they put, they, they, they develop Coke and added strawberry flavor. What are right. they doing? Mm. They're innovating. Innovation. If you are a professional and you mm. can innovate your career from one level to the other, you are in problem. You've got chaos mm. on your hands. That's a fact. Mm. So your capacity to innovate, to, to think about the times, because if your career is dependent on your capacity or your propensity to provide solutions to problems, that mm. means if you provide a solution to a problem and that problem does no longer exist, your career will go moribund. Right. That means you, you need to be able to think about new problems you can innovate to provide solutions to is the fundamental bedrock of career progression and development. Nobody does career for fun. Even when you do, to be paid for it, people must enjoy <laughs> what they give them. It's true. Mm. People must enjoy what you give to them. And so mm. understanding yourself and space becomes a very powerful strategy. Understanding self and space. What do I mean? So how do you understand self? So what do you have to give? What have you got? That involves your knowledge base. What do you know? If you are dull, you can't give what you don't have. Right. So what, what skills have you accomplished do you have? So it's a function of the, the alignment between yourself and your space. So mm -hmm. you have all of that. Then secondly, 
what does your space need? You almost have to wake up every morning. I'm not kidding. And think of yourself. So what what other problems do people have that I can help with? Mm. You think. So when people are complaining to me, you know, you know, Africans, we love complaining. When yeah. they wake up in the morning, they say, hey, that government head is not correct. Then mm -hmm. everybody will join the conversation on Twitter. On It mm -hmm. is true. It's useless. Mm. For me, when I hear problem, there is an excitement in my tummy. Because wow. I'm, you know, it's true. It's, it's, it, 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 you have to build yourself that way. So mm. think of problems as raw materials for your sustenance. Mm. Without a problem, you cannot survive. You have to mm. provide a solution to be relevant. It's the only basis of career growth and development. And mm. all other things fall in place. So what partners do you need mm. to make a solution, make it easier? What skills do you have? What knowledge do you need? What is available in your spaces? And all of that becomes a fundamental premise to go the mm. career. Right. Right. Wow. Powerful. <laughs> you know, I'm going to take a quick a question from um, Facebook. Monier Ayub says, Dear Doctor, what do you say about the quality of online degree? Is it the future or does it lack the interactive experience we get in class studies? Okay, good question. Yeah. So, so it's a good point to raise. So, if, if, if um, so before COVID, Okay, there was a huge, especially in Africa, there was a huge mm. perception around online programs. Oh, how credible is it? What is the quality of administration? Mm. I, I advise the University of London, okay, and that's one of the top universities. It's got the largest portfolio of distance learning programs in Europe, one of the most reputable in the right. world, University of London. I am the Africa, I am the Africa advisor. And right. If you take a University of London program, you would know for clarity that it is as robust, if, if not more robust, than a face to face program. Mm. So, is, excuse me, is your understanding what the dimension of the online provision is? Now, mm. some programs are provided fully online, okay? But the elements around interactivity, around engagement, maintaining quality, Understanding content and how you present the content it are the key things that, that make that online program powerful enough so it's comparable and even better in most cases than mm. Facebook programs. And so my point is to answer your question, oh absolutely, online programs should be designed to function effectively and give the right amount of transformation and impact as face-to-face -face programs. And there's some some cases where you have blended approaches where you have some online programs and some face-to-face -face sessions just to kind of complement that. But my point is, it's about you understanding what programs do you need, what is the design pathway, and how does it fulfill your needs. Mm. Mm. Wow. Wow. <laughs> this is so interesting, so powerful. It's packed full. I'm going to quickly ask in this, um, you know, with the wake of COVID and with, um, you know, the chaos that have taken over the entire world, how would you, what would you advise, what would you advise an African, uh, international African professional to, um, how would you advise for, um, for, for a professional to develop career resilience? No, good question, you raised. So, when I hear the word resilience, um, so logically or basically, you define resilience as the capacity for a substance to bounce back in the, mm. in the midst of pressure or crisis mm. or chaos. It means by definition, you cannot test, this is important, so listen very carefully, yeah? You cannot test resilience without chaos. Okay? Mm. But look at the good thing. You don't have to wait for chaos to develop resilience. That's a different right. Thing. You right. can't test resilience without chaos or crisis. That's a fact. Because the resilience is your capacity to bounce back or withstand pressure in the midst of chaos. And so you don't have to wait for crisis to happen in order for you to develop enough resilience. Mm. So think Resilience, like that extra feel 
in your tank you keep just in case there is no more fuel mm. that extra food resources or that extra bag of rice you bought just because you had a premonition that mm. maybe next five months bag of rice will become expensive so something tells you buy an extra bag and keep in the cupboard that mm. is that is you preparing for an eventuality mm. human beings are so i'm looking for the right word to, to be very very nice human beings are so carried away by time they will never prepare until they are thrown in the bubble in the crisis mm. what do i do next why yeah. do you have to wait until that happens so if i were you this is very important for every student every professional listening to me you should start investigating that's why i was telling you in the earlier question an understanding yeah. of yourself and your space mm. so understanding what, yourself in your space what what potentially would happen in your career space in the next four years do you know what would happen in medicine in the next four years do you know mm. what would happen in engineering you you do you, you do realize that automation and robots will take over human beings in a mm. year, in the next four five years if not less mm -hmm. so do you wait and say well when it happens it happens wouldn't you start preparing your resilience package come on now <laughs> <laughs> speak on pastor <laughs> would you start preparing your resilience package in advance of the crisis and chaos because mm. whether you like it or yes friends there is crisis and chaos coming to every career it's now left to you to decide if you want to be on the right side of the crisis or on the left mm. i'm not trying to be a prophet of doom but guess what do you realize that there has been as much jobs follow me that have been provided during covid as has been jobs that have been lost but the difference is there has been as much less people prepared to take on those new jobs during covid that's the Absolutely. problem wow wow your capacity to bounce back friends people who know me know i used to be a gallivanter what i mean is i traveled all over the continent you know people i remember a particular time where i think for over two weeks I didn't do any LinkedIn post of which country I was. People put mm. out people were asking me, Doc, ah, where are you? Are you not in Kenya? Give us some new new, new gist of which country you are. Friends, <laughs> after COVID, you will have to beg me and I would have to love you so much to travel. Because I've discovered that I can make as much money and impact not leaving my house as I would mm. That's because so I can now project. Mm. I am preparing in advance of what the impact of the situation would be on education. There are articles, mm. there are books. In your spaces, what is the likelihood of impact in your spaces? If you know that, then you can prepare and develop mm. a resilience package. Wow. You know, I, I was saying to, to someone, this COVID, <laughs> me, Okay, uh, I apologize. Um, well, this is the much we can take today on the rebroadcast of our very all important uh, chat we had with Dr. Akanimo Odon. And uh, of course, if you are joined in from the very beginning, we did mention that we had technical issues with our guest for today, who was joining in from the uh, DRC. And so we had to reschedule the broadcasts for another time when he will be able to join from a, um, join us from a, a, a good network area. And so that's the much we can take. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, please um, follow, like and follow our page on Facebook because Facebook will be taking away the facility of creating watch parties because I know a lot of people join us uh, via watch party and haven't um, liked or followed us on our page. Our page is swab. 21 is SWOB21 on Facebook. So you just type in 
SWOB21 and search it. You will find the page. Like, follow. And of course, if you're watching from YouTube and you haven't subscribed, please press the bell button right now. And um, well, subscribe. And then when you do, press the bell button. I do hope to see you again next weekend. Of course, on Instagram, we are Africa underscore rise dot TV. I do sincerely apologize. We don't have control over many things, especially the network. So our guest um, was really um, sad that he couldn't come on today. But we do hope to see him um, talking um, the same topic next time. I will see you um, next weekend. God willing, have a wonderful week ahead. Bye-bye.